Hello and welcome to Illinois Lawmakers' weekly coverage of the spring session of the Illinois General Assembly during the month of May. I'm Jack Titchener, and I'm joined by Rich Miller, the publisher of CapitalFacts.com. Good to have you on the show, Rich. Thanks. This first week of May seems to be more about what's not happening here at the Capitol than what actually is. Uh, a lot of the referenda that were uh, poised to go on the, referend the uh, ballot in uh, November have gone the way of uh, all things. Uh, the uh, graduated income tax went down in flames this week. Yeah, a whole lot of nothing, man. <laughs> uh, a lot of these <clears throat> had very little chance of passage anyway. Because you need three-fifths in both chambers. Right. And as we've seen over and over and over again, um, Speaker Madigan's uh, supermajority is in name only. It's about three shy of actually being one. Depending on the vote, yeah. yeah. Well, the, the sponsors of that uh, measure thought they could pick up three GOP members, but yeah. Jim Durkin's had pretty good party discipline this year. Amazing party discipline. The guy, uh, I don't know if he can do this for the entire first term of Governor Rauner, um, but so far, so good for him. He's held that caucus together. They have not participated in any overrides of the governor except one, and that one he gave them permission to do it. Legislative redistricting in terms of a referendum from originating in the House and Senate also off the table this week. What happened there? Uh, well, the Senate approved a redistricting proposal that really wasn't a reform. Uh, in name only it was, and the House sent one over that was actually quite good, uh, better, I think, in my mind, than the one that uh, the, the people are trying to get on the ballot to, via petition. But, you know, the Senate president really enjoys the remap process. He loves it. Um, he lives for it. Hmm. And I just do not think that, you know, did not think that he would ever let that one go. Does the petition drive uh, seem to have legs? They've got quite a few, they've got more than enough signatures on the thing. Signatures should be no problem. It's really hard to go through 600,000 signatures and kick 300,000 of them off. Um, the question is the legal aspect. Do they have an angle here to stop them uh, from getting it on the ballot? By they, I mean the Democrats mm -hmm. uh, who currently control the remap process. So you expect a challenge? Um, yeah, I do. But I think, in my opinion, this is really short-sighted by the Democratic Party, even if they kick this uh, thing off the ballot in the fall. Because legislators shouldn't be choosing their voters. Voters should be choosing their legislators. And if it does get on the ballot, this is not a, a very good amendment. Um, and what happens if uh, you know, Governor Rauner is reelected? And then, you know, the last time they did the map, right, they drew it themselves. Um, because they had a Democratic governor. Uh, next time, it's not going to be so easy. Quick uh, question before we go, uh, before we move on. Is the governor's optimism in trying to get a budget out of here by the end of May well-grounded? No optimism is grounded in this building, period. They are making progress, that's true. But it's going to come down to whether the Democrats, particularly in this chamber, were in the House, want to work with him and get something done by the end of May. Kind of comes down again to Speaker Mike Madigan. And his members. Thanks, Rich. Still more to come on Illinois Lawmakers. We're going to take a look at trying to find more money for social services, and we'll talk more about those budgeteers meeting on the budget behind closed doors. Joining us now on Illinois Lawmakers to talk about the future of social service funding in the human services area of the state, we have Chicago Democratic Representative Greg Harris, who chairs the House Appropriations, uh, House Human Services Appropriations Committee, and Deputy uh, House Republican Leader Patrick Bellock, the GOP spokeswoman on the Human Services and Human Services Appropriations Committee. It's good to have you both here. Uh, you're two of the top people in this area here in uh, Springfield, mm -hmm. and of course, hardly a day goes by that we don't see another headline or news story on the local television about another human service agency that is deeply in trouble. Most of them have gone nearly a year now with, without any state funding. 
who's actually uh, being left out at this point? Some things are still going, but others are not. Representative Bellick? Well, it's pretty much the human services right now, because up until last Friday, it was the universities and the community colleges and the human services. But now it's really crucial that we get some funding to some of the human service groups who are desperate. What are the, what are the, what are the problems you're hearing, Representative Harris, mm -hmm. in terms of uh, the local agencies that, develop, that actually deliver a lot of the services the, the state They provides? haven't been paid for a year, that they are running on fumes. They are essentially providing services to the most vulnerable people in our community, seniors, children, uh, you know, people with disabilities, and the state's not paying its bills to them. And that's just unconscionable and it's wrong. And there's a whole other class of folks who are not even in line to get their bills paid, you know, after school programming, youth programming, you know, autism programming, immigrant and refugee services, which the governor just keeps vetoing out of the budget. And that's something we need to address. How much would these agencies uh, at the local level normally get in a typical budget year? It depends on the, the, yeah. the group, but right now the, the governor's office has issued about $350 million of uh, community service agreements telling people to proceed even without funding. So just in that category alone, there's almost half a billion dollars worth of services which have been provided at the request of the state for which we have no authority to, authority to pay. And yesterday you saw a lawsuit filed by you know, hundreds of charities saying, wait, you told us to go do this work. You gave us written documents. We signed a contract and you have still stiffed us for the money. Is that pretty much the last resort going to court? Oh, yeah, it's this? definitely the last resort. And if you look back, starting from last year, I mean, 90% of the budget is court-ordered right now when you talk about Medicaid, the um, you know, all the employees of the state. You know, the only thing that really got signed off was education, you know, early on in the year. And uh, at this point, you know, there's been talk now for a couple of weeks at least of uh, providing some sort of stopgap funding bill to try to help these uh, agencies. I believe the, uh, it's like something on the order of $450 million in emergency, serv um, emergency funds. Could you give us a bit of a breakdown on how that would work? Sure. So there are, there are special funds that are not part of general revenue where the money is just basically sitting in the bank waiting to be spent. And uh, Leader Bellock and I were talking about this this morning of trying to find a way to at least get that money out as a you know, partial temporary fix to you know keep some of these agencies going till we settle a, a final budget deal. Where, where, where would that money come from, Representative? Well, that money came from out of when we uh, when the income tax increase was passed mm -hmm. about four years ago. They kept out they kept an education fund and a human yeah. service fund. So one one thirtieth of that went into that fund. Now is that only a one time thing? Yes. Uh, because that, that, that income tax has expired, the, that increase, the temporary increase has expired. Right, yeah. So um, we have that money in there right now, and um, we're very supportive of trying to get that money out right away. I mean, we're hoping to pass a bill next week, if we possibly can, to help, you know, sexual assault services that are going out of business next week, anything that is desperate. And it's the patchwork, you know, it's the framework of all the most vulnerable um, services to our communities. It, that's passed the Senate already? Yes. And a version has passed, yes, and right. what we would like to add to it is we, we've identified about a quarter of a billion dollars in other state funds, and those of us who are around here know that other state funds are dedicated funds to a purpose, like uh, paying for affordable housing sure. or supportive living that can't be spent anywhere else. We should just get those out the door. So that would be above and beyond the $450 million that's right. in this commitment to Human Services Fund? Yes. yes, we'll have to take a look at it. Um, what most people need to clarify is that it, we're looking at things that are from special funds, what we call other state funds, so it's not out of general revenue, which is unconstitutional to make an appropriation of that when you don't have a budget. Why is it taking it this long to get to this point? It's been 10 months. Well, there's been a lot of discussion going on back and forth. I think we have to focus on moving forward with what's going on right now, and there is conversations in bipartisan, bicameral. Uh, well. And, and what's happened this year is unprecedented anywhere in the history of any of the 50 states. You know, the, we, the General Assembly passed a budget to the governor, and the governor essentially vetoed every single item in it except K-12 funding. Typically, we've you know all seen in, in, in other states, if the governor thinks, oh, you're spending too high, then he would say, well, I'm going to veto X percent, or I'm going to bring these lines down. But instead, they chose to veto the entire budget, and it has left us in this quandary. It, no, it's totally uncharted territory, and now we're being governed by court orders, consent decrees, lawsuits. 
because uh, nobody really knows how to proceed forward. And we're almost in the next fiscal year. We need to fix this. How long, uh, how long is this, this stopgap funding measure going to keep things going? And who's going to get it? Is there, is there sort of a triage list of the agencies that are most needing it? Mm -hmm. most needful? Yeah, there is a list in that bill. And uh, it's just a stopgap. It's really a bridge, you know, and we're hoping to have a regular budget, hopefully, uh, you know, in May. And I think Leader Ballack and I would agree that, you know, it's not up to us to pick right. winners or losers. Yeah. Right. And we need to, you know, do it on a pro rata basis so everyone gets their fair share. Right. Well, uh, of course, behind the scenes, there are negotiations going on. There was an ad hoc group of uh, women lawmakers. Right. Uh, I don't know who was in that group necessarily, mm -hmm. but I've got some ideas on sure. that. Started talking about this several months ago, and now yeah. the ad hoc discussions have kind of bridged into a, uh, a more... Um, uh, a, what we used to have, something called the budgeteers, and you all are kind of in that right. group. You're uh, the top people in your caucuses mm -hmm. on that. Uh, what can you tell us about what's taking place behind the scenes in terms of uh, the well, talks? That's, that's supposed to be kept behind <laughs> the scenes. Is it like Vegas? <laughs> what happens or stays there? <laughs> I think the good part about it is there's discussions going and everybody's participating in them and we're moving forward hopefully to try to get a budget by the end of May. Whether that will go forward, you know, it'll depend on the what we uh, present to the leaders. Representative? Yeah, I, I, I think it's very good that we're talking about these things, but I think we're now coming, the, there's probably 95% of the things that we're all going to be able to agree on, mm -hmm. but when you get down to that last 5%, that's where the, you know, if there's going to be a butting of heads in conflict, and that's going to be where, we, you know, the, we, we see whether we come to an agreement or not. And, and, and that's kind of the way things used to be done around here. You, you'd start to see these, mess, these uh, meetings start to take place in April when uh, you had some idea of what the revenue projections were going to be for the, right. for the next quarter in the coming year. Mm -hmm. And uh, these folks would get together and talk things out. And uh, they'd get pretty close to the... To, to the final agreement and hand it over to the leaders and their staffs and the governor. Mm -hmm. Is that pretty much how this is working? Right. I would say that that's how that's working. But as Greg said, you know, 95% of that can be done, but then it goes back to the leaders. You know, and, and, and the things that are really likely, and this is sort of the, the differentiation between this year and other years, the things where heads might but get butted together are not budget-related issues. They are things that are different than the budget Going back to the, the stopgap bill for just a moment, is there any reason that uh, you know this didn't pass at the same time when the higher education stopgap funding bill uh, went through a couple of weeks ago? What's going think, on? Well, I think there was a lot of concern because of what happened the night before on the floor with the education bill alone that it started to semi, you know, um, start to fall apart a little bit, and then um, Representative Mayfield called, you know, pulled it out of the record. So we definitely wanted to get that education out because we knew how important it was for the MAP grants and for Chicago State and all that to pass. And a lot of people were concerned with the two together mm -hmm. that uh, it, they might, it, the whole thing might fail. So. So having, a, if you will, a clean bill, so to speak, mm -hmm. with human services being dealt with strictly on their own and trying to find some of these additional funds from sweeps in addition to that $450 million, you think you've got a better bill that, that can go? Well, I, I, I think it's very clear what it does, as uh, Patty said, and we want to be sure it's fair. We want right. to be sure that we don't go outside the parameters of you know, monies that are really available. We don't want to give false hope to people, but we do want to do everything we can to uh, get something passed and in the pipeline. And, you know, last, uh, a few days ago, of course, that $600 million for higher ed passed, and then just within a few days, uh, Chicago State still went ahead and laid off 300 people. Are you, are you concerned that what you are putting together for social services and human services might find some of these agencies in the same straits? It just isn't enough at the last We've moment? We've already seen right, Lutheran right. Social Services lay off 750 people already. We've seen Catholic Charities close some of its services already so we know the harm is being done you know our, our job right now is get is, if, if this money is available to get it in the pipeline to help as many people as and we you can think help. you could do that as early as next week it's critical it's critical that it be done then I mean I was hoping that we could get it done this week because um, there are, you know as Greg said there are agencies that are just on the brink of going out some already have you know and it's in, increasingly important um, to keep that momentum going on this bill and and the full budget. Representative Bellick, Representative Harris, thanks very much for your time. We're going to get some insights into more of those budgeteers' meetings in our next uh, segment here on Illinois Lawmakers.
Joining us now on Illinois Lawmakers to discuss the budget-making process in Springfield, Chicago Democratic Senator Heather Staines, who chairs the Senate Appropriations One Committee, and Deputy Senate Republican Leader Matt Murphy of Palatine, the GOP spokesperson on the Senate Appropriations Committee. Good to have you both on the program. We just had a, a very moving moment here in the House chambers uh, honoring fallen police officers and firefighters. And one of the things that was just mentioned on the floor is that the death benefits to the families of those who have been killed in the line of service can't be paid now because of the ongoing budget dispute. Just another reason to try and get this done. Absolutely. There's, you know, seniors who aren't getting home care delivered meals. We have um, folks who, many social service agencies who are having to close their doors and not be able to provide mental health care and substance use treatment um, to folks. Homeless youth programs are not getting funded. Rape crisis centers around are having to lay off all their counselors and people who have been victims aren't able to get help. I mean, on and on. This has been going on way too long. We need a budget. Senator Murphy? Yeah, the collateral damage is real. And uh, the collateral damage goes beyond, though, uh, those issues pertaining directly to our budget to our jobs climate and the fact that for far too long, this state has been too hard a place for people to succeed. And, you know, if we're going to be the best partner we can be to those social services going forward, we're gonna to need to rev up our economy substantially, and that's gotta be part of this equation too. So you're alluding, of course, to Governor Rauner's turnaround agenda, which has kind of been at the center of this for the past almost uh, 11 months or so. Well, it is 11 months now. Uh, you are now both publicly identified as two of the budgeteers. Uh, the, some of the leading people on both sides of the aisle who uh, are actually sitting down having meaningful budget talks. Can you t give us some insights into what's being discussed be below the sight lines? Well, I mean, there's an effort to, to, to sort of land the plane, as, as we say here, and, and bring this uh, to resolution. Uh, you know, part of this is getting a budget that balance is done. The governor has said, you know, he is willing to sign a tax increase. That has been on the table as part of this. There will be spending cuts as part of this from the budget standpoint. I think there are people uh, on both sides of the aisle who recognize that the governor has a fair point on some of the other things that he's talked about, and I th and, and that's all part of the conversation here as well. Senator Staines, of course, uh, a few days ago, uh, Natasha Karecki in Politico mentioned that some of the items that are being discussed include uh, an income tax increase, a possible expansion of the sales taxes to uh, services. Uh, and uh, some progress towards workers' compensation reform, which has been, uh, been a key uh, area that the governor wants uh, as part of his reform package. Uh, how much can you tell us about what's actually being discussed? Well, you know, the um, official budgeteer group where each of the leaders has appointed people is focused just on the budget. Um, the conversations uh, until yesterday really been focused on providing information on where things are. Just yesterday, and again, we're meeting today, um, it's starting to turn into real discussion. Um, I'd like to believe we can make some progress. You know, the, the budget itself, I think, is uh, fairly straightforward. It's sort of a math issue. You, know, you need to have things add up to how much revenue, how much spending, balanced to zero. Although at this point, too, what we are also taking into account is we have a backlog of bills. Uh, we think we need to get that paid so we can actually pay vendors. Um, so they're not under, um, they're not funding the debt of the state that we take that off the vendors and maybe provide them some relief in this as well. That, those conversations are going on. I'm hoping we can make progress. They're not, we're not charged there to talk about the um, turnaround agenda items. Are you, are you talking specific numbers in terms of percentage points, for example, on the income tax, Senator Murphy? Well, I mean, again, as, as Senator Staines indicated, the, uh, the uh, budget group that uh, involves all four caucuses in the governor's office is trying to make that math problem work. Uh, the governor himself has discussed uh, an openness to a tax increase to, to help bridge what is a very big divide. And, uh, and Senator Staines is right. We have uh, a deficit here. I, I hate to call it a backlog of bills. That sounds a little too uh, colloquial. But, uh, you know, we owe people money, and we've got to figure out a way to pay them back. And, and I think there's bipartisan support to get that done. There's a, def there's a deficit and there's a backlog of bills when it comes down to it. Because when the temporary tax increase uh, uh, went away uh, about a year ago, uh, you know, you're looking
looking at uh, taking in about $32 billion in revenue against expenditures now of around uh, $38 billion, in addition to what, another six or $7 billion in bills? Is that about right? right. That's about right. Yeah. How, how much revenue does a one-point increase in the income tax uh, actually generate? Is that a range of uh, two, two billion dollars, something like that? On a one point, if you assume it's both the income tax and the corporate income tax, uh, one point would be about $4 billion in that range. And, and talking about service taxes, a lot of states do that, Illinois doesn't, but I know we've taken uh, runs at that in the past. I remember a few years ago, one of the uh, former lawmakers said, well, Governor Thompson talked about adding, uh, this, extending the service tax to, say, uh, hair salons, and by the time everybody got back to uh, Springfield the next week, they had already heard from all of the beauticians around the state that that was a non-starter and the thing was dead on a Right. Yeah, that is a uh, that is a sales tax on services, uh, old wives' tale for sure. And it, uh, you know, I think there was a, a bill passed in the Senate not too long ago, or a few years back, that actually uh, did not include uh, that service in the uh, in. So I, you know, there is some some truth to that as a as a concern. I think. So if if, if that if that if that's any kind of an analogy, so you'd expect doctors, lawyers, mechanics, and everybody else. That, oh my gosh. They'll be you know, I think ultimately things become much easier when they're done in a package. Um, you know, our revenue system really is not does not keep pace with economic growth. Um, services is the faster growing part of the economy, yet we don't include that in our sales tax base. Um, you know, retirement income, you can say people are old, aging, we don't include any of that in our income tax base unlike other states. I'm not saying that these things are on the table or not. I think though, I think we need to do an overall modernization of the revenue system and when you do things in a bigger package, sometimes you have an easier time, one vote, getting things accomplished. There was a discussion this week of actually trying to move the state to a graduated income tax, which the majority of most states do, but it, it, it failed. Yeah, well, Jack, here, I, I, if you look at where we're at as a state on tax burden, we've got the highest property taxes in the country, we've got high sales taxes. Personally, I think that graduated income tax is going to chase productive people out of the state. But when we have a revenue conversation, it's really important that we take into account the fact that the other way to raise revenue is to create more jobs and more taxpayers. And part of what we're talking about with improving the jobs climate and what you refer to as the governor's turnaround agenda is directly targeted at making it easier for people to get the best job they can get here so they're paying more in taxes even at our existing rate. We need to grow more jobs, make more taxpayers, and be a more sustainable revenue stream at the state level by that. That's got to be part of this conversation as well, because we tried raising taxes once without these fundamental reforms, and it didn't solve all our problems. It wasn't a panacea. You can set up stains in here, Senator. Uh, you know, I do. I, I, I think, first of all, um, when you've seen states who have gone about this just reducing your taxes, um, they're now... In have, like at Kansas, they're having huge challenges now just balancing their budget. This, it'll all get replaced by economic growth theory. I don't think is always um, successful. Uh, also, just want to note that over the last number of, uh, of years, we've gone from um, having nine, the 90 percent of folks, you know, 90 percentile uh, in wealth generation, um, who used to uh, themselves. Um, really generate and be able to um, grab a lot of that economic growth has narrowed. That 90% of the overall population now gets like 0.4% of economic growth, and they used to get 70% of economic growth. This, I think, is what's driving a lot of what we're seeing um, in our heated politics right now, is this lack of ability for most of us to actually generate economic growth out of our economy. The governor has said in recent days that he, he has some grounds for optimism that you're going to be able to come up with a two-year budget plan covering the rest of fiscal 216 and uh, 2017 to come beginning March, or excuse me, July 1. By the end of May, do you, do you share that optimism? Well, you know, I, I to sort of walk into this Capitol building every day, I have to be a half-class full person. Um, I think it's got a lot of challenges, um, but I do remain optimistic that there are conversations going on across the aisle. I appreciate the ability in the Senate that we really are having a lot of those conversations. I think it is going to take looking at revenue, spending cuts, and reforms. We understand that. I think those reforms, though, have to be done in a way that does not undermine core democratic values. Um, and as long as we 
we can continue to have productive conversations about how we do this and thread that needle, I think we can make progress. Senator. Jack, we can bridge quickly. We can bridge this divide and actually resolve this this month. I know the governor wants to, I know legislative Republicans want to, Senate Democrats I know want to, and I think a lot of rank and file House Democrats do too. What I don't know is whether Speaker Madigan wants this resolved or not. We shall we shall see where that goes in the next few weeks. Thank you very much very much to you both. We certainly appreciate your time. That's it for this week's edition of Illinois Lawmakers. We'll be back every week at this time during the month of May for the latest on the spring session of the Illinois General Assembly. Before we go, we want to remember a dear friend in public media who worked closely with our team over many, many years at Illinois Lawmakers, Stacy Tomchek, the program director of WTVP Channel 47 in Peoria, died Saturday after a brief illness at the age of 45. The station manager, Moss Bresnahan, says no one had a greater dedication to WTVP and the mission of public broadcasting than Stacy. Her love of public broadcasting, her creativity, her kindness, and her sense of humor made her a joy to work with. Public television was a major passion in Stacy's life, and she spent much of her 19 years at WTVP promoting a wide range of station activities on air, online, and in print. Stacy was deeply committed to using public media for early childhood education and led her station statewide Young Writers and Illustrators competition. Stacy Tomchek will be deeply missed.